Hello everyone, and welcome back to History 1151. In our last video, we discussed the first people that came to the Americas, who would eventually become to be known as Native Americans or Indians. In this video, we are going to discuss the people who came to the Americas by water around the end of the 15th century, Common Era. We will consider the first Europeans who came to the Americas, who they were, and why they came here. You're probably wondering, why are we talking about Europeans and their lives in the old world? Isn't this class about America? Well, you're not wrong to ask yourself this question, so let me tell you why we're going to be discussing this background information. First, when discussing the migration of peoples, for example, Europeans who migrated to the Americas, scholars talk about two big issues, push factors and pull factors. Push factors are issues or struggles that a people face in their homeland, which motivate them to want to leave their ancestral lands in order to find a home in a different part of the world. They include things like a lack of land for settlement, resource shortages, famines, diseases, warfare, religious persecution, and oppressive governments, among other issues. Leaving one's country, family, and culture and making a difficult and dangerous journey by sea to an unfamiliar land can be a daunting experience. So knowing the factors that led European colonists and migrants to leave their homelands is very important. Second, we must consider pull factors. Pull factors are benefits that a new land or country offers to potential immigrants. They can include things like cheap, plentiful land for settlement, abundant natural resources, readily available employment, and freedom from oppressive institutions. Later waves of migrants can also add chain migration, the reuniting with immediate and extended family who have already migrated to a new land from the old country as a pull factor as well. Any combination of the aforementioned factors motivated the European colonists, migrants, refugees and settlers who came to the Americas from the late 15th century onward. Keep these terms, push factors and pull factors, in mind as we continue in this course. As the immigrants who come to the American colonies, and eventually the United States, came for many of the same reasons that motivated the first Europeans to come to the Americas. I want you all to see the continuities and the patterns in immigration over the years. But I also want you all to see change over time as well, and how migrants' motivation shifted as time went on. Who were the first Europeans to arrive in the Americas? The first confirmed European arrivals to the Americas came not in the late 1400s, as you might think, but much earlier, around the year 1000 of the Common Era. These first Europeans to come to America were the Vikings. The Vikings, seafaring raiders from Scandinavia, were skilled sailors and shipbuilders, settling Iceland between 850 and 875 CE, and they settled Greenland in the late 900s, although scholars debate whether Greenland should be considered a part of Europe or North America. What you all need to know is that the Vikings reached the mainland of North America, what is now Newfoundland, around the year 1000 of the Common Era. Leif Erikson, son of the famous Viking explorer Eric the Red, was determined to establish a settlement in North America. He would have called this land Vineland because of the blueberry and cranberry plants that grew spontaneously on what would later be known as the Canadian coast. Iceland and Greenland were very cold and had poor, rocky soil, so the fertile fields of Vineland were a massive pull factor for Vikings like Leif Erikson. The push factors that Leif and his companions faced were increased centralization of the Scandinavian society, as the Norse people adopted Christianity and created a more united political system. Many Vikings fled their homelands during this period for Iceland and Greenland, and most determined to set out for Vineland. Leif Erikson stepped ashore on Vineland in the year 1000 and peacefully traded with the Native American peoples of the Beothuk culture who called the land home. The Vikings called the Native Americans Skraelings, although the exact etymology of this term is unclear. 
Some think that scrayling may have been a reference to the Native American's copper-colored skin, while others think it may have been an onomatopoeia for the high-pitched battle cry they would make. While Leif's interaction with the so-called scrailings was peaceful, later interactions would not be. Leif's brother, Thorvald, sailed to Vineland in 1004, and in a surprise attack killed several of the Beothuk people, who responded by attacking his ships and killing him with an arrow. The Vikings returned in 1009, led by Thorfinn Karlsefni, who brought three ships and as many as 250 other Vikings with him, suggesting he was preparing to establish a permanent colony in Vineland. While relations between Thorfinn and the Skraelings were initially peaceful, and the Vikings traded the Native Americans milk and dyed wool for animal skins, the relations quickly turned sour after Thorfinn's bull got loose and began to chase the Skraelings. The natives responded, attacking Thorfinn's party, killing several of them and forcing them to retreat to their ships. The sagas, the best written records we have of the Vikings' exploration of the Americas, suggest that the Skraelings attacked the Norsemen with a type of siege engine, perhaps a catapult or a ballista. Once again highlighting Native Americans' technological sophistication, especially when it came to warfare. Archaeological evidence backs up the Viking saga's claims that the Norsemen reached the New World. The evidence also indicates that while the Vikings established outposts in the New World, none of them were inhabited for long periods of time, most likely because they were unable to establish peaceful relations with the native peoples who lived in Newfoundland, as attested by the sagas. In the 19th century, some people thought that the Vikings may have established temporary settlements in New England, and further to the south, although more, more recent archaeological analysis of these sites suggests they were actually Native American in origin. The Norse people failed to establish permanent settlements on the mainland of North America, and they would ultimately abandon Greenland in the 1300s CE. The Norse people left Greenland for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons they left was due to climate change, a cooling trend that made the cold, harsh land of Greenland even more difficult to inhabit it. Additionally, one of the Norse Greenlanders' most important economic industries, the harvesting of narwhal tusks, began to be severely undercut by the emerging ivory trade, as European traders from Portugal began to explore the West African coast and trade with the people there. So, in the grand scheme of things, the Norse people's settlements in both Newfoundland and Greenland were temporary. Now that we've discussed the first Europeans who came to the Americas, let's skip forward almost 500 years to the end of the 15th century. By the 1400s, Europeans had been trading with East Asia, what they called the Indies, for centuries. This trade took place almost entirely over land, using a millennia-old trade route called the Silk Road. The Silk Road allowed goods and people to pass between Europe and the Far East, greatly benefiting and having a profound impact on the civilizations of China, Korea, the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East, and of course, Europe. Transporting goods across the Silk Road could be a very lucrative endeavor, as the route was very long, being over 4,000 miles. The train was rough, crossing arid deserts, high mountains, and desolate plains. Before the development of steam power and the internal combustion engine, all cargo being transported by land had to be moved by muscle power, on the backs of donkeys, in carts pulled by oxen, or in packs carried by humans. Additionally, traders on the Silk Road could be vulnerable to attacks from bandits. Traders were also forced to pay local warlords for safe passage on the trail through their lands. These payments, which cut into their profits, were a mix between a bribe, a toll, and protection money. Traders moving east to Asia brought wool, iron tools, and precious metals to sell in Asian markets. On their return trip, the traders brought spices, jade, and of course, silk, a soft and easily dyed cloth that was a major status symbol for medieval Europeans, who generally wore rough, coarse textiles made of wool or flax linen. Additionally, the Silk Road allowed ideas to travel from east to west, 
Christianity, Judaism, and Islam passed eastward along the Silk Road, and technological developments like gunpowder, paper, compasses, and block printing came to the West. Europeans would experiment with and adapt these technologies, all of which would play a role in their colonization of the Americas. Marco Polo, an Italian Venetian merchant, traversed the Silk Road from 1271 to 1295 and recounted the riches of Asia in his travel narrative, The Travels of Marco Polo. Polo brought high quality Asian goods back to Venice and his travels convinced many Italian traders and nobles that the key to European financial success lie in trade with Asia. One Italian trader who was inspired by Marco Polo was named Cristobal Colombo, better known as Christopher Columbus, but we'll talk more about him later. While the Silk Road brought many benefits to Europe, primarily in the form of luxury goods and new ideas, it also brought certain things that made life more difficult for medieval Europeans. The Mongol Empire, under leaders like Genghis Khan, advanced westward, roughly along the Silk Road, threatening European cities like Vienna during the 1200s, shortly after Marco Polo made his journey to Asia. The most disastrous thing for Europeans that came from the Silk Road was not a people group or a good, but a disease, the bubonic plague. While some scholars think the bubonic plague caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis may have reached Europe as early as the 500s during the reign of Byzantine Empire Justinian I, the greatest pandemic of bubonic plague that Europe ever experienced occurred from 1347 to 1351 CE. The Yersinia pestis bacteria jumped species from arboreal rodents to rats somewhere in Central Asia, possibly Mongolia although scholars debate the plague's exact origin. In recent years, scholars have come around to the idea that the plague was introduced to Europeans on purpose by the Mongols during the siege of Kaffa, present-day Crimea in 1345. The Mongols used catapults to launch the bodies of plague victims into the city in an early instance of biological warfare. Once inside the city, Fleas on the bodies of the, f the dead bit and infected Kaffa's rodents, which then went aboard European, specifically Italian, Genoese ships. Once they reached Europe, the rats were bitten by European fleas, and these fleas then bit humans, spreading the disease rapidly through Europe's urban trade centers. To make matters worse, the bubonic plague bacteria would mutate and become aerosolized, being spread by coughs and sneezes, only increasing the disease's rate of transmission. The bubonic plague presented with symptoms including high fever, black swollen lymph nodes called buboes, from which we get the name of the disease, and ultimately death. While the bubonic plague has a 90% survival rate with modern medical treatment, including antibiotics, a medieval European afflicted with the plague had about an 80% chance of death, depending on their age, level of health, and other circumstances. The plague, also known as the Black Death, killed at least 50 million Europeans, about 50 to 60% of Europe's population. The disease's rapid spread across Europe and Europeans' inability to understand this pandemic's causes or treat the afflicted led many to think that the plague hailed the apocalypse or divine judgment for humanity's sins. While the plague subsided in the late 1300s, its disastrous effects would have a profound impact on European culture, particularly its perspectives on death, disease, and religion that would be felt for centuries to come. Medieval European society, particularly the church's failure to contain and mitigate the plague would help to inspire the Renaissance, a period in which Europeans emphasized learning and study, especially the study of secular Greco-Roman texts, in order to add to the sum total of human knowledges. In some cases, they used the, this knowledge to question long-held Christian beliefs. At the same time, many church leaders supported the Renaissance, patronizing artists and scholars who are part of the movement, like Michelangelo, 
who painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in 1512. The pace of the Renaissance would advance over time due to technological developments like Johannes Gutenberg's printing press in 1440, which allowed books and knowledge to be disseminated far more rapidly than was previously thought possible. In 1453, about a century after the end of the Black Death, the great city of Constantinople, capital of the Byzantine civilization, the final remnant of the Roman Empire, fell to the Islamic Ottoman Turks. The loss of Constantinople was a traumatic effect for medieval Europeans, the vast majority of whom were Christians, although they followed the Catholic Church of Rome, rather than the Eastern Orthodox Church, which was based in Constantinople. The fall of Constantinople was a significant event in European history. While Eastern Orthodox and Western Roman Christians had not always gotten along, they had a long tradition of putting their differences aside and coming together to fight non-Christian foes, as seen during the Crusades and other events. Yet, in the fall of Constantinople, their attempts to work together to prevent Turkish expansion failed, shifting the balance of power in Eastern Europe away from Christian Europeans and towards the Islamic Ottomans, who had ruled Southeast Europe for centuries, and would even try to capture Vienna in 1529 and again in 1683. The Ottoman Empire would officially come to an end after the First World War and the creation of Turkey as a modern nation state in 1923. While Christian Europeans would make alliances to fight common enemies in the future, the fall of Constantinople in 1453 was the beginning of the end of this type of religious-based alliance in Europe. From here on, Europeans would increasingly come to identify with their nation, i.e. France, Spain, England, etc., although religion would still be important. It would be less of a unifying issue. The fall of Constantinople, while it reshaped European balances of power and diplomatic relations, it also helped to inspire a new European military culture. For centuries, medieval Europeans had relied on static military formations and large, slow armies that would fight from behind castles or thick city walls. Constantinople's walls, once the jewel of European fortifications and thought to be impenetrable, were no match for the Ottomans' use of gunpowder, specifically their large cannons called bombards, which pounded much of the city's walls to dust while also killing its defenders. Additionally, the Ottomans used dynamic, aggressive tactics, like taking their ships apart and moving them over land in order to circumvent the Byzantines' naval fortifications. The fall of Constantinople taught Europeans that if they were going to resist the Ottoman expansion, they would have to adult, adopt and even improve upon Eastern military technologies like gunpowder. They would also have to develop more dynamic, flexible tactics. These revelations would help to initiate Europe's so-called military revolution, in which European strategists, tacticians, and scientists develop new weapons, tactics, and strategies helping to make Europe the world's dominant military power. Many of the technologies developed in the European military revolution would play a major role in the colonization of the Americas. We will discuss such things in future videos. Beyond the military developments, perhaps the greatest impact that the loss of Constantinople had on 15th century Europeans was of an economic and intellectual nature. For centuries, Europeans had relied on Constantinople as the western trailhead of the Silk Road, from which they gathered both goods and ideas from the east. The loss of Constantinople meant that Europeans, if they wanted to continue to trade with Asia, would have to find a new route to the Far East, one that went not over land, but across the water. Additionally, scholars, scientists, and artists, and learned people in general from a variety of backgrounds fled Constantinople, during the siege of the city and afterwards. They brought Greek and Roman texts and knowledge with them to Western Europe. These scholars and the knowledge they brought helped to speed up the pace of the ongoing Renaissance movement in which Europeans had gained an increased interest in Greco-Roman knowledge, initially with the support of the Roman Catholic Church. Over time, however, these discoveries would undermine the Catholic Church's authority and would inspire the Reformation. 
During the Reformation, Christian reformers, most notably men like Martin Luther, a German monk, called for reform within the Catholic Church. Luther issued his 95 Theses in 1517, calling for reform. And when his proposition failed, Luther began a new church, separated from Rome. The Reformation saw the Roman Catholic Church torn apart, and a series of new Protestant, they were called this because they were protesting the Catholic Church, sects, including the Lutherans, Calvinists, and Anglicans, be formed. The Reformation divided Christian Europe. Where European Christians had once come together to fight non-Christian enemies, now they fought each other in a series of bloody religious wars, which divided Christendom and helped to give rise to the modern European nation-states we know today. I mention the Reformation and Europe's religious wars because these developments would have a profound impact on how the European powers would approach their colonization of the New World, as you will see in future videos. Now that we have discussed some very important background information, you should have a basic understanding of the challenges that Europeans faced on the eve of the Age of Exploration. You should understand why they would want to leave Europe and explore the world by sea. In the 1400s, the people of the Iberian Peninsula were best positioned to become the continent's premier maritime explorers. As I mentioned before, it was the per Portuguese who first began to sail south and east to the West African coast, using a fusion of eastern and western maritime technologies to improve their ships. The Portuguese began constructing sailing vessels called caravels, which, unlike previous European ships, had multiple masts and triangular sails, and were powered by wind rather than rowers. Multiple triangular sails could be more easily adjusted than a single square one, allowing for beating and tacking, or sailing windward against the wind. Caravels were fast, sturdy, and maneuverable vessels that could travel further and faster than oar-powered galleys that had been used for centuries on the Mediterranean Sea. Using their caravels, the Portuguese would set up fortified trading posts called feitorias, or factories, which were essentially proto-colonies from which the Portuguese traded goods selling weapons in exchange for ivory, gold, and eventually enslaved Africans. Elmina, built on the coast of what is now Ghana, was one of the Portuguese most important factories in Africa. Portuguese leaders, most notably Prince Henry the Navigator, sponsored exploratory voyages and factories with the hope that Portuguese vessels would find a route to the Indies by sailing around the coast of Africa. Portuguese explorer Bartholomew Diaz sailed around Africa's Cape Good Hope in 1488, opening up a practical, if long, sea route to the east that would eventually be completed by Vasco da Gama in 1497 and 1498. By the 1490s, Europeans knew that they could sail to Asia, and they also knew, contrary to common thought, that the world was round. So many began to question whether or not there was a route to the Indies that was shorter and faster than the trip around Africa. One such man who asked this question was Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus, or Cristoforo Colombo, as his name would be rendered in Italian, was born in Genoa in 1451. Columbus was born into a family of humble means, and he left home at a young age to become a mariner. Sailing across the Mediterranean and as far north as the British Isles, and as far south as the West African coast, where he visited the Fort Portuguese factory of Omina, discussed previously. As a sailor, Columbus fought in naval battles, but he also transported and trading goods. As a trader, Columbus saw the value of selling goods from the east, and he began to research and calculate a new route for Asia by sailing westward. It is worth noting that Columbus had almost no formal education and most of his knowledge was self-taught. Columbus petitioned European monarchs to sponsor his voyages. King John II of Portugal rejected Columbus's proposal, believing, rightly so, that he had miscalculated the circumference of the earth. Columbus sent his brother to petition King Henry VII of England, but his brother was captured by pirates and waylaid. Columbus petitioned King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain 
for support of his mission to the Indies in 1492. Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile, who had recently married, unifying their realms to create the Kingdom of Spain, were looking to distinguish themselves in their new country. As an aside, the Spanish dialect spoken by the people of Castile, Castilian, would become the official legal language of the nascent Spanish Empire, helping to unite disparate colonies spread across the world. Language is a key tool of empire. The young monarchs, under the counsel of their advisors, initially turned Columbus down, but they changed their minds as they were looking to distinguish themselves in their new kingdom, as I said before. Columbus had already left Spain and was en route to petition the king of France when he received word that the Spanish monarchs had changed their mind. Ferdinand and Isabella agreed to sponsor Columbus, partially on the condition that he would spread Christianity to the Indies. Religion was very important to Ferdinand and Isabella, who had just captured Granada, the last Moorish Islamic stronghold on the Iberian Peninsula, completing the centuries-long Reconquista, or the retaking of Iberia by Christian Europeans. The Reconquista would loom large in Iberian, particularly Christian culture, for centuries after 1492, and the Reconquista experience would define their approach to colonialism as well. Columbus himself also wanted to spread Christianity to the East, and he hoped that the profits from his journeys would be used by Christian Europeans to recapture the holy city of Jerusalem, then controlled by the Islamic Mamluk Sultanate. Although Columbus was living in the Renaissance, he was still very much a medieval man in his desire to initiate the Crusades and retake Jerusalem, which would have been very appealing for him, especially after the fall of Constantinople in 1453 when Columbus was two years old. Ferdinand and Isabella promised to make Columbus admiral or viceroy, ruler of all the lands that he discovered and claimed for Spain and the Indies. On 3rd August, 1492, Columbus, with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, left Palos de la Frontera on Spain's southwest coast, sailing westward. His ships briefly docked in the Canary Islands and took on more supplies before they continued to the west. Spain's colonization of the Canaries is also a fascinating topic, but is a bit beyond the scope of this course. Columbus and his men sailed for over a month after leaving the Canaries, and his crew contemplated mutiny as they worried that they would be lost at sea and run out of provisions before being able to reach Asia or return to Spain. On October 7, 1492, their fears were assuaged with the cries of Tierra, land, from the crow's nest. Columbus and his men had not reached East Asia. They had arrived in the Bahama Islands, off the coast of what is now Florida. Columbus named the island he landed on El Sal San Salvador, but the natives called it Wanahani. Columbus and his men called the inhabitants of San Salvador and the surrounding islands members of the Arawak and Taino peoples, Indios, or Indians, believing they had reached in India. Columbus noticed that the people of the Bahama Islands were peaceful and quick to learn Spanish, although he observed that many of them bore scars from attacks from other native tribes who tried to take the islanders as slaves. This realization apparently inspired Columbus to suggest the El San Salvadorians and other Indios might make good slaves for the Spanish. In terms of the language you used at the beginning of the video, push factors for Columbus and his followers would have been a lack of economic, religious, and military opportunities in Iberia, as the Reconquista came to an end and Spanish rule was centralized under one crown. Pull factors would have been the allure of wealth in the supposed Indies, gold and a desire to convert the Indians, and eventually Indian slave labor. In all, Columbus led four expeditions to the Americas. His first mission, which was mostly peaceful, was a success, but later voyages would prove more controversial 
not only to modern onlookers, but to Columbus's contemporaries as well. Columbus's second voyage saw him lead an expedition of over 1,200 colonists with the plan of establishing permanent colonies across the West Indies. That same year, Catholic Pope Julius II divided up the New World between the Catholic monarchies of Spain and Portugal in the Treaty of Tordesillas. Upon arriving in the Caribbean, Columbus found his settlement on Hispaniola had been destroyed after the settlers, seeking gold, had angered the natives. Columbus and his settlers made new settlements on Cuba and Hispaniola and established the encomienda system, a form of unfree labor which enslaved non-Christian inhabitants on the islands. Columbus and his settlers also set up a colony on the island of Borican, now known as Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was the first European colony that would eventually become part of the United States. The encomienda system in the Spanish Caribbean colonies was extremely harsh and saw many native workers die from overworking, abuse, starvation, and disease. Additionally, by 1494, about two-thirds of Columbus's colonists in Hispaniola and Cuba had died from disease, starvation, or in skirmishes with the island's indigenous inhabitants. Contributing to these battles, Columbus had captured and enslaved almost 1,500 Arawak people, including women and children, who were transported back to Spain to be sold as slaves. About 40% of them died on this forced journey. Columbus returned to Spain in 1496, but the death of, col of the colonists, combined with the slaving, angered the Spanish monarchy, who felt that these issues prevented the Christianization of the quote-unquote New World. To make matters worse, Columbus refused to believe that he had not reached East Asia, even as others began to realize that he had in fact discovered a whole new part of the world. Columbus's third voyage, 1498 through 1500, saw Columbus arrested by Spanish imperial authorities for his violence against both Indians and his own colonists. The Spanish mar monarchy agreed to fund a fourth voyage for Columbus, but they stripped him of his title of viceroy due to his brutal mismanagement of the colonies. On his fourth voyage, 1502 through 1504, Columbus reached the North American mainland in what is now Honduras and Panama, where he caught a glimpse of the Pacific Ocean. Columbus died on May 20th, 1506, at the age of 1504, maintaining the belief that he had found a lost part of East Asia even as evidence mounted that he discovered a whole new landmass, the Americas. The efficacy of Columbus's plan of sailing west to reach the east would not be confirmed until the voyage of Ferdinand Magellan, whose party was first to circumnavigate the globe, sailing around South, South America's Cape Horn, entering the Pacific and reaching Asia before sailing back to Spain via the African coast from 1519 to 1522. Looking back, many words can be used to describe Christopher Columbus. Bold explorer, self-taught scholar, and visionary, or slaver, mass murderer, and madman. In a way, all these attributes would be apt to describe this enigmatic, mercurial, and controversial figure. Columbus's discoveries paved the way for Europe's colonization of the Americas, which had a profound impact on European society and culture, changing the course of Western civilization as a whole. For the native people of the Caribbean, and indeed the Americas as a whole, Columbus and his settlers' arrival was the beginning of the end of their way of life. Their numbers were decimated by war, enslavement, exploitation, and disease. The native peoples of the Caribbean, even more so than those in the mainland, were almost completely exterminated by European colonization, particularly the encomienda system. Columbus's discovery, or rediscovery, of the Americas would inspire subsequent waves of European colonization, which would have a profound and detrimental effect on the Native American cultures and civilizations of mainland North and South America, although their deaths would be caused primarily by disease unwittingly brought to the continent by Europeans, rather than exploitation by settlers, as was case in the Caribbean. So Columbus's legacy today is very mixed, to say the least. 
We have discussed the migration of humans from Europe to the Americas in the age of exploration. But we should also briefly discuss the movement of non-human plant and animal species, which were moved between the Americas and the Old World from the late 1400s onward. Europeans introduced new plant and animal species to the Americas. They introduced livestock, including cattle, pigs, chickens, and horses, the last of which became a key part of the lifeways of the Native Americans of the Great Plains. They introduced a variety of plant species as well, including apples, bananas, sugarcane, wheat, and citrus. The Europeans also brought animals like turkeys and plants like peppers, tomatoes, and potatoes back to the Old World. Although it's worth noting, there were species of peppers already in the Old World. These were just new species from the Americas. This exchange of biomass between the Old and New Worlds has been called the Columbian Exchange. While the Columbian Exchange had many upsides, giving the peoples of the Americas and the Old World additional food sources and animal companions, this exchange also included the transfer of microorganisms, which spread diseases between the hemispheres. The diseases unwittingly brought to the Americas by Europeans and later Africans had a far more devastating effect on Native Americans than the contagions that were brought to the Old World from the Americas. As we go forward in this course, we will be discussing some very difficult and controversial subjects. As historians, our job is to discuss the past and learn as much as we can about why the people of the past did what they did the world they came from, the challenges they faced, and how they viewed their surroundings. Understanding these issues does not excuse the violent or immoral acts committed by people in the past, but it can help us to learn more about human nature and how to keep such things from happening in the future. As the famous American historian Lawrence Levine once said, it is not the historian's job to pass judgment on the past because the historian is too busy being involved in both the prosecution and the defense. That is what we will be doing in this course, considering the events and the people of the past from a variety of perspectives.